Okay, thank you so much for joining that joining us today. My name is Jen Cool. I'm the policy and campaigns lead with the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. And CAPE is a member based national organization that works on research and advocacy at the intersection of human health, human and planetary health. I'm currently living um, on the unceded traditional indigenous territory of the Huron Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. And I I think it's really important that we um, acknowledge territory um, not because it's a sufficient form of reconciliation, not because it's a sufficient form of like a sufficient amount of the work that we have to do, but because it's a, a marker and a reminder that um, we live in a country based that is based on colonization um, and many of the challenges that we're facing and that the world is facing um, related to climate change um, have to do with um, the way like particularly in Canada have to do with the way this nation was founded um, with violence against indigenous peoples and so I think it's really important that we we continue to keep that present in the work that we do um, and especially this week but always I think it's important to be mindful of um, anti-black racism in Canada. Um, it's as much a problem here as it is in the US. Um, and um, that's, con that's connected, uh, again, that's so connected to the work that we're doing at CAPE, um, both because as you're gonna hear from our panelists, um, climate, ch climate change disproportionately impacts racialized communities around the world, um, be it from um, droughts uh, in Southern Africa, um, flooding as we saw in Hurricane Katrina that mostly decimated black communities um, or resource extraction here in Canada where the health impacts of that are, are, are almost exclusively borne by indigenous communities. Um, so part of the work of tackling climate change um, is doing work to address our own white supremacy and doing, our, doing work to tackle racism both within ourselves and within the organizations that we work in um, and so um, I sent I sent an email around earlier today with like a couple of resources two of the books that have been recommended to me to do um, some of this work are um, The Skin We're In by Desmond Cole um, and White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo um, I'm also going to post a link in the chat to an article that friends of ours at 350 wrote that talks about the intersections between racism and climate justice um, and calls for a just recovery. Um, and I'm also going to post um, a link that has some other resources. Uh, before we get started, I just want to orient you to using Zoom a little bit. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little speech bubble that says chat. If you click on chat, um, there's a there's a blue thing that says all panelists. Um, and if you click the arrow for the drop down, you can um, you can choose to select all panelists and attendees. And if you select all panelists and attendees, everybody in the webinar will be able to see your chat. So I'm going to invite you to do that now. Um, and to let's just um, to check that everyone's able to access or that, that folks have figured out where that chat is. Maybe just tell us where um, where you're calling in from today. So um, if you've got yeah, chat, all panelists, attendees. There we go, a couple of people. It's always interesting to see the, the variety of places people are calling from. Awesome. Okay, and as people check in, I'm gonna uh, invite our, I'm gonna introduce our panelists. Um, today, we're joined by Dr. Samantha Green, who's a family physician in downtown Toronto. In addition to her work with CAPE, Samantha is a member and former chair of Health Providers Against Poverty. She teaches about advocacy and social determinants of health. Samantha is an ardent cyclist and a lifelong environmentalist have, and formerly served on the board of directors of the Sierra Club. We also have Dr. Dr. Edward Chia, an emergency doctor in Toronto. He became interested in climate-induced crisis while working with asylum seekers in Canada and internationally with Medicine Sans Frontières. His research and advocacy work now looks at how inequality affects health and relates to global problems such as climate change, homelessness, and addictions. 
He studied policy and economics to understand how these issues are connected and the ways they can be improved for a healthier future. And we're also joined by Dr. Nicole Redvers, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine, Indians and Medicine program at the University of North Dakota's School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She's an enrolled member of the Dene Nukwe First Nation Band with con continued ties to the Canadian North. She's a co-founder and board chair of uh, the charity Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation based in the Canadian North and currently sits on the advisory board for the American Public Health Association Center for Climate, Health and Equities Steering Committee. Um, and we're gonna start with Samantha. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for having me on this panel. I'm a little bit intimidated by my fellow panelists and also by uh, some of our audience members here, but um, just jump right in. I just have a few slides to share and just a few reflections and then I think uh, Edward and Nicole will, will expand on some of my, my thoughts. Uh, so I don't have any financial conflicts of interest. Uh, as you've heard, I am a board member with CAPE. And I also approach this work, of course, that says worth, but it's meant to say work, uh, of course, from my privileged position uh, as a physician. Uh, I act as an ally and I have a lot, a lot to learn. So, so um, I just wanted to start off by uh, talking about some reflections I've had lately. Um, I've been thinking about those in my practice who have been most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, both directly and indirectly. Um, we know from Ontario data, and you'll see, I think, some graphs a little bit later on, um, that's been collected uh, by the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, that people who live in poor neighborhoods and people of color are more likely to test positive for COVID here in Ontario. Um, so I think of a patient of mine who I'll call Cheryl, who's a 63-year-old woman with severe COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and she lives alone in Toronto community housing. And she's socially isolated at the best of times. Um, and now she's been at home for over two months. Um, she's anxious about the risk of potentially contracting COVID and she has really remained at home, um, completely isolated. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the first patient I wanted to highlight. Uh, there's another patient of mine uh, who I'll call Manuel, uh, who's been forced to continue working at his uh, low wage construction job under conditions that he feels are unsafe, um, putting himself and his family at risk of COVID. He lives with his wife uh, and three children in a two bedroom apartment in the crowded neighborhood of St. Jamestown. And then there's John. Uh, who's a 45-year-old uh, with schizophrenia who lives in and out of the Toronto shelter system um, and who is therefore amongst those at higher, highest risk of contracting COVID-19 at the moment. Uh, we know here in Toronto right now um, the bulk of the pandemic is being felt in congregate living settings, so long-term care and the shelter system. And you know, these patients are the same patients who are most at risk of poor physical and mental health outcomes from climate change. Um, like COVID-19, we know that climate change exacerbates existing health and social inequalities, including those attributable to race, immigration status, income, and housing. Uh, the World Health Organization, as you probably all know, has called climate change the biggest health threat of this century. And while the world is currently focused on the more immediate threat of the COVID pandemic, we can't neglect the looming public health threat of climate change. Um, we know that climate change has a range of health effects, um, which I'll just briefly review, um, including increased heat-related illness, um, worsening lung and heart disease from increased air pollution and forest fires, direct injury and displacement from floods, droughts, and other extreme weather events, uh, changes in vector-borne illnesses, including uh, Lyme disease, but also malaria, West Nile virus, dengue, and Zika. Um, and increased food insecurity. Um, 
And when we consider each of these health effects, we know that those who are already marginalized are most at risk. So Cheryl, who lives alone with COPD, uh, is amongst those most at risk of heat-related illness. Uh, and she does not have an air conditioner and can't afford one. Uh, so for the last several summers, I've actually really worried about her on extreme heat alert days and worried that her breathing could be affected and that because she's socially isolated, no one would know uh, if her breathing suddenly deteriorated. Um, and then there's Manuel, who supports his family with his low-wage construction job and is most at risk of climate-related food insecurity. Uh, and he's also less, less likely, like all people living in poverty, to have insurance or money to recover after an extreme weather event like a flood or a storm. And then there's John, who is experiencing homelessness and is also most at risk of heat-related illness and worsening of heart and lung disease from climate-related air pollution. Um, and then, of course, we know globally that the smallest and least developed countries ha um, bear the most harmful burden of climate change, although they have contributed the least to the problem. And I think Edward will speak more to this. Um, we know that uh, the United States, European Union, China and Russia and Japan uh, emitted, have emitted about two thirds of global carbon emissions. Um, and the United States is actually responsible for a quarter or more than a quarter of the total green greenhouse gas emissions of the last century. Uh, and yet the World Health Organization estimates that 99% of disease burden from climate change will be in, is and will be in low income countries. So um, what can we do? Well, the root, root and upstream causes of both climate change and social injustice are often the same, um, including our energy systems, transportation, land use, housing, um, food and socioeconomic systems. And so I think what we can do is focus our attention on interventions that act on the upstream shared systemic causes um, to address both climate change and also uh, social injustice and health inequities. So this is a photo of a group of climate justice activists in the United States demonstrating for a Green New Deal, uh, which is, as you probably know, pushes for transitioning to use 100% renewable zero emission energy sources um, with investment in um, electric cars, high speed rail systems, implementation of a carbon tax. Um, and besides increasing jobs, this Green New Deal is also meant to address poverty by aiming interventions in the lowest income and racialized communities. Um, and CAPE is actually um, one amongst 150 organizations in Canada who have been calling for uh, a just recovery uh, from COVID uh, here in Canada, which would look maybe similar to, to what, what, the, what is a Green New Deal in the United States. And finally, I also wanted to just say a word about um, what's currently happening both in the United States, but also here in Canada. Um, as you may know, the environmental movement was actually built on a foundation of anti-Black and anti-Indigenous discrimination and racism. And while a lot of work has been done within the movement to address these racist roots, um, Black people are still severely underrepresented in mainstream environmental groups, are less likely to identify as environmentalists, and are less likely to participate in outdoor recreation, uh, despite consistently reporting higher concerns about the environment and climate change. Um, and, and I think part of the problem is there are many in the environmental movement who do not see the link between racism, climate change, and climate justice, uh, and the health inequities that will, will and already are resulting from climate change. Um, or sometimes people see the link but feel we have to address the problem separately, but really we, we need to be addressing both, both things together. And I just thought, um, I'd end with this interesting quote from a really interesting organization in the United States called the Hip Hop Caucus. Um, I can't breathe. Those words are incredibly important to the climate and environmental movement. How do we make sure our movement is responding to all the ways people can't breathe, particularly black people? I just think it's something, I mean, now it's really come to our the forefront of our attention, but something that we should be thinking about at all times, particularly given uh, the effects that we are already seeing and will see of, of climate change and the climate crisis. So that's all I have to say. Thanks, Samantha. We'll uh, turn to Edward. 
Um, hi, uh, and, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. And, and thank you to Samantha for um, introducing this topic and um, you know covering a wide range of different ways that uh, there are climate injustices in the world. Um, I'm hoping to take um, a small portion of that and try to unpack it and um, highlight some of the connections between these different things. Um, so first I wanted to show this great image, uh, which is from this new um, uh, movement in Canada called uh, uh, Just Recovery for All. Um, and I think this really highlights what we're trying to accomplish with this webinar, which is to build solidarity and equity across communities, generations, and borders. Um, and I encourage you to go check out this website as well to learn about some of the ideas that hundreds of organizations around the country have uh, come together to produce. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, you know, this word that we see all the time related to climate change or related to, to COVID, which is the word vulnerable. And I want to ask us, you know, what do we mean by the word vulnerable? It's a, it's a term that's um, sometimes helpful, but, but oftentimes um, is kind of vague and doesn't really uh, allow us to understand some of the underlying problems that Samantha highlighted. Um, so let's think about, you know, what this means in society in general, but also related to climate change. And, you know, when we're talking about climate science, the word vulnerable is often unpacked into these three dimensions, which are sensitivity to environmental changes, exposure to changes, and capacity of people to adapt. And this is how, for example, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada would assess vulnerability to climate change. But you know, there are also a whole bunch of factors that influence the sensitivity, exposure, and capacity. And these ones are societal and they're systemic. Um, they're also ones that we're familiar with. Uh, and I think what I want to point out here, what I want to emphasize, is that it's the process of marginalization, of disenfranchisement, of disempowerment along these lines that create that vulnerability and not that people start off as vulnerable. So it's important to examine these connections in order to fight climate change at its roots, um, because these are the same connections that we need to fight COVID-19 as well and, and a lot of urgent crises that we have. Um, I'm going to start off by showing some information about COVID-19 because this is obviously top of mind for a lot of people. So this graph is showing cases in Ontario over time from March to May and it shows a disproportionately heavy impact on racialized people and newcomers to Canada. It's that rising dark blue bar at the bottom over time how more and more people are affected um, from those communities. And the same set of data shows that, you know, people with the lowest incomes are also much more likely to get COVID. Again, it's the, that rising uh, dark blue bar at the bottom. And, um, you know, I'd like to ask, you know, what explains this unequal impact? And I think Samantha has already talked about a lot of those reasons. Um, here's another one. This is a, a great graph from the uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, uh, analysis done by David McDonald. And it, it shows who can't physically distance at work based on income. And we see that at the far left end, you know, the people who are making minimum wage or lower are the ones who are disproportionately impacted by not being able to follow public health measures. Um, this is a, a proportion of workers in February and March uh, before the, the, um, the bulk of the crisis hit at each wage category who were not able to, to distance from other uh, co-workers. We also know that Racialized people and newcomers to Canada are more likely to live in neighborhoods with poor quality housing, and they're more likely to be in jobs on the front lines in essential roles like personal support workers, um, food service people, delivery workers, and cleaners. But these are also people who may not have access to personal protective equipment, may not have access to paid sick leave. And these are you know, factors that contribute um, directly to this, uh, this disproportionate impact. Next, I'm going to go even more local from Ontario to, um, uh, to the city that we work in, uh, Toronto. Uh, this is a map of material deprivation, and, and, and I've simplified that to, to poverty, but it inc includes different factors like low income, like less access to education, uh, employment, less access to safe and affordable housing. And again, the dark green shows areas where there's more poverty. Um, and you know, if we look at where these areas are on the map, um, it's also the same areas where there's a disproportionate uh, um, burden from COVID. It's where the, the rate of uh, COVID infections is higher as well. Um, but if we look at, uh, you know, climate change, um, uh, the, the map again looks quite similar. It's the same places where people are at higher risk from heat waves. This is a Toronto Public Health um, 
uh, vulnerability index. And again, the darker the red, the higher the impact of rising temperatures in Canada. So what are the reasons for this higher vulnerability? Well, it's a lot of the same reasons that people you know, are at higher risk of COVID. So it's higher density housing, not being able to afford air conditioning is, is more of a heat one. Um, things like poor urban planning that leads to areas without vegetation or tree cover or parks, um, more paved services, uh, more uh, air pollution because people are forced to drive instead of having access to fast uh, public transit and, uh, and also isolated living situations of seniors. Um, the last thing I'll point out though, you know, despite these disproportionate impacts is there's no area of the city where it's completely free of vulnerability. Um, despite this greater impact on marginalized people, everyone in the city is affected and it's important to remember that we don't have a vaccine against climate change. There's no one who's going to be immune in Canada. Uh, it's the same around the world as well. Again, vulnerability is caused by forces of marginalization. We see that um, you know, when we compare different countries. So here, the people living in less advantaged neighborhoods of the world are those that are also at higher risk. And again, the darker red shows uh, higher risks. And despite all these harms uh, that we're already seeing, Canada as a whole will fare better than countries in the global south. Um, but in order for us to thrive as, as people in Canada, we still need to rely on the global community for freedom from conflict and war, for medicines and innovation, and for people who add new perspectives to our society and who boost our economy, uh, and for our food as well, something as simple as that. You know, Canada is the sixth largest importer of food in the world. Which brings me to um, you know, where that food comes from. So if you've ever been to a supermarket, you know that one of the places where a lot of our food comes from is Mexico. And I was there doing some work related to climate change in the good old days when we were still allowed to travel, which was in February. Um, I was trying to learn about how climate change was affecting people in Mexico and Central America. And as expected, I read reports that, um, you know, it's changing weather patterns, it's shifting seasons and increasing diseases. Um, and one of the biggest concerns there was uh, drought as well. But I also heard that climate change is disempowering the traditional knowledge of people living on the land including you know, shifting planting season so it was no longer predictable, including changing the pattern of when rain was going to come. And um, I was traveling through an area in Southern Mexico where a large part of the, uh, the population is indigenous, <clears throat> including uh, Mixtec people or Mixtec people. And uh, what I really um, liked was, was that, that, uh, you know, that um, uh, name for the people is often translated as people of the rain. And, um, and people in this farming village that I was walking through told me that there used to be eight streams that fed their fields uh, and towns a generation ago, but now there were only half as many. <clears throat> and I, I'm not sure whether climate change was directly responsible for that, but what I do know is that there's going to be higher temperatures, there's going to be lower rainfall in the region, and that's going to contribute to worse uh, water scarcity. And in bad years, like you know, what's happened in the past, when crops fail, people travel to find work, to supplement their incomes. Um, COVID-19 has had a major impact on that resilience strategy. And it's, it's the, the, the rural people, the, the people um, who are resilient despite poverty, people with limited access to health care uh, who are disproportionately affected. And it's these factors leading to poverty and producing vulnerability that are some of the same ones that are creating climate change, such as land use that degrades the environment, extractive industrialization, and colonialism as well. Um, and that's why it's, it's important uh, to, to look at these just recovery principles, including building solidarity and equity across generations, communities, and borders. I, I want to end this by bringing the story back to Canada. Um, last Saturday, a 31-year-old temporary foreign worker named Bonifacio died of COVID-19. He was from Mexico. Uh, he came to Ontario to work on a farm to make our food, which helps our economy run. And in the region of Ontario where he worked, almost one out of five people with COVID are farm workers. And I want us to ask ourselves, what made him vulnerable to COVID-19? And among the connections that Samantha and I have talked about, what contributed to this, to this tragedy? Um, you know, what I've reflected on is that <clears throat> when you don't have money, you don't have a choice between working through illness and, and missing your paycheck. Uh, when you don't have money, you can't choose not to ride a bus or to, to sleep in a, in a bunkhouse. Um, when you don't have money, you can't turn down a job um, in an oil field in Alberta or a gold mine in the Amazon or as a, as a farm laborer thousands of kilometers away from home in the middle 
of a pandemic. And climate action needs to address all of these factors. Um, so, it, you know, just going back to this idea of building resilience to prevent uh, future crises, what I hope I've drawn is connections between some of these systemic contributing factors and the unequal impacts of climate change. And, you know, building resilience um, uh, by, by strengthening communities is one of the ways that we can accomplish it. Um, when I was in that village in, um, uh, in Mexico, I was sad to hear that people were losing their language and culture. Uh, my guide there told me that it's, it's only the grandparents um, who still speak, uh, it's a Zapotec language there. And it's things like language that are, that are the ties that hold communities together. And, um, you know, Nicole, that's why I was so excited to hear that uh, about the first graduates from the Dene uh, Educator Program uh, that just graduated, I think, in the past week. Um, I, I just want to end by, by asking us to, uh, you know, to think carefully about what we value. Um, and this, this question is one I took from uh, policy analyst Brittany Andrew Amofa, uh, which is, you know, asking us to take a moment to think about what are the biggest problems that we face and then think about uh, who is affected by these problems. You know, if we're concerned about air pollution, who is most affected by that? And then to ask ourselves why, and I hope we, we can have a discussion about that later on. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Redfors. Thanks, Jen, and uh, also to Samantha and Edward uh, for your words today and sharing uh, uh, your stories and, and wisdom on this uh, important topic that we're here to talk about today. And I think uh, one of the things that I always uh, try to remember when we're talking about um, uh, communities in regards to social justice issues, and in particular Indigenous people, is to always think about the strengths first. Uh, I think it's easy sometimes to always jump right to the disparities and, and some of the issues uh, that our communities are facing. But um, I really try hard to remember that we are strong, resilient people as Indigenous people and always make sure that we're opening on the strengths that we do have, uh, the deep and profound knowledges uh, that we have retained uh, through the thousands of years, uh, whether it's through traditional knowledges, language and culture, or whether or not it's even through our own scientific thoughts. Um, having said that, uh, we obviously are very clear that uh, there are a lot of vulnerabilities within the Indigenous communities globally, as you know, Edward uh, so sufficiently described and outlined, and, and same as Samantha as well, that uh, you know, these vulnerabilities exist for many uh, reasons that are complicated by intertwined layers uh, that are very complex in terms of their um, origins and also the potential solutions for uh, ways to move forward. And with that, I think combining the thoughts of both of those, we really think about um, the need for Indigenous self-determination within some of these movements and how this recognition of Indigenous traditional knowledges uh, could be, and I believe to be, a critical foundation for planetary health through a social justice lens. And I think on reflecting on even the term social justice, which in essence we could think of of being the equitable distribution or even uh, a justice in terms of the uh, division of wealth, of the division of opportunities and privileges within a society. But I think what's more important for me is the principles that social justice embody. And those are things like equity, um, access, participation, rights, and I think if we look at Indigenous societies today, embedded within our natural ways are equity, access, participation, and rights. It's embodied uh, innately within the elements of society through a collectivism um, that's a part of the natural state. So it's often not talked about as a social justice issue because the principles of social justice are automatically entwined within those natural laws that we exist within. And I think the element of natural laws is one that deserves more attention because all of our facets of Indigenous society, no matter whether it's social justice or food or culture or language or the health of their planet, are embedded within this set of natural laws. And if we think about it from a Western standpoint, you know, we can think of laws like thermodynamics or gravity or those types of 
uh, laws that we know that govern the rules of our universe. Whereas if we think about natural laws through an Indigenous perspective, it's much more broad and, and wide than that, really based on a collective interconnection between all things and a responsibility uh, to uh, not only ourselves, uh, but to the earth and the universe on whole. And when we see those natural laws being broken, uh, whether or not it's through consumptive processes, through extractive processes, through non-equitable, non-accessible, non-participation and rights-based movements happening, then the expectation is, is that we will see things like climate change start to spin out of control. We will see some of these injustices start to come forth because that's the natural product of the natural law being broken. So these are not surprising outcomes from what we would see or expect from some of our uh, uh, prophecies on how these laws operate within our world and how we can facilitate change back to a more balanced society. And I think when we uh, look at things like traditional knowledge, we could almost think of it as being a bridge between natural laws through a set of traditional protocols, which you'll often hear about Indigenous communities, which are sort of the, um, the operationalization of those natural laws and how we implement within society uh, the ways to respect Mother Earth or the reciprocity that's needed for that um, process to happen. And traditional knowledge, you know, for me is really that interconnection between those pieces of that broader knowledge system that is so innate within many of our societies that we um, know of today and still uh, exist today. Uh, so the Indigenous conception of something like planetary health really is led through traditional knowledge, um, being more species and environmentally inclusive, uh, where we really see everything around us um, and you know, our relation to them as being essentially the same. So one of the things that you know, I think is important and you know, I've often voiced this is if we think about things like, um, or the term epistemology, which a lot of people have probably heard of, which basically is the theory of knowledge. And we know that there is a Western theory of knowledge or a Western epistemology, and there is an indigenous epistemology. And the way that I see it, and you know, have had conversations in indigenous circles around this, is that if a certain uh, epistemological underpinning, so let's say Western theory of knowledge, has been the producer of the problems that we have, such as climate change, consumerism, some of the other things that have come about from colonialism. If we're using that same theory of knowledge to try to say, solve the problem that it created in the first place, that there's a disconnect there because that epistemological underpinning is the same uh, solution as the cause. So for us as Indigenous people, if a solution or a problem is being created by an epistemological knowledge system that doesn't mold with those natural laws, then by trying to create solutions within that theory of knowledge will not lead to success long term. So for us, it really is about going back to and examining those values and knowledge systems and how we actually move forward. And this directly goes back to that equity, access, participation, and rights uh, that we are talking about today, which is encompassing the term social justice and how you know, these uh, knowledges that we're in right now may continue to perpetuate planetary harm through the intensification of um, what is the progression of a colonial uh, thought process really primed on perpetual consumption. So, you know, I think these are deeper reflections uh, as we go forward in our movements, particularly even in environmental movements where Jennifer so succinctly outlined that often there's a disconnect between environmental activism and how they may actually connect to social justice issues um, without you know, the, the direct connection of these uh, things being interconnected because by the very nature of natural laws, everything is connected. Um, so I often encourage people to remember that when we're talking about uh, anything to do with the planet, uh, we're automatically guided by those natural laws. And the only knowledge system that connects those in a way that's rooted within a meaning of collective strength that allows all people in all uh, societies to be um, equitable, accessible, have uh, no hierarchy in terms of the participation and rights, that we really need to start re-examining our solutions to ensure 
that where we're going to go as a society has the possibility of ensuring that the next seven generations after us um, can really be uh, primed, productive, and healthy uh, people within our societies. So I'm very hopeful uh, through these signs of resilience that we see within our Indigenous communities, although we have lots of problems um, you know, that we need to sort through, and this is not going to be an easy journey. I'm seeing uh, the example of many young people that are starting to uh, come out, and our elders tell us that uh, a lot of our old elders that passed away a long time ago are coming back through these young people. They're coming at a time of crisis where we need their wisdom to be able to come through and help to guide us within society. And I really see that with our young generation be more open and willing to speak out um, against these injustices, uh, be more willing to stand up for equity, access, participation, and rights. And that resilience, I think, and that backbone is going to reflect and uh, become uh, or uh, demonstrate a sense of leadership that we really need within this crucial time of change and that we're all going through right now. Um, this time is not a surprise to many Indigenous people. I've heard many elders talk about prophecies of the great time of sickness that was coming. And this was 40, 50, 60 years ago that these stories were passed on, that there was going to be a time uh, where the sickness would come and the world would start to change and the world would have a choice depending on the, the decisions uh, that were made after that time. They did say there was a second sickness that was going to come that was going to be more stronger after the first one. Um, and and then after that, uh, depending on that choice that people made will determine the collective outcome of humans and humanity and all of the others, uh, four-legged and two-legged on Mother Earth. So what I hope today is to just give a very brief glimpse of some of the conceptions around some of the traditional knowledge systems that have existed, um, not necessarily quoting out social justice because Again, it was innate within that society, but how we can utilize those knowledges, those natural laws, and those traditional protocols through traditional knowledge to be able to help guide us back to a path of where we need to go um, as society. So, uh, Masi Cho, uh, for allowing me the time to speak today and, and share some of these words. Masi. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you again to all of you for sharing uh, your wisdom and your experience. Um, and um, for, for rooting us so well in the times that we're in. Um, if you have questions for our panelists, please, uh, I invite you to put them in the chat. Um, I, um, well, so I'll just give folks a minute to do that if anybody's got a, a burning question that they'd like to ask. Um, okay, well, well, while people think about it, um, I have a question, which is, um, what, what is the thing in, in times like this, uh, where, what's one thing that keeps you, um, like, motivated and hopeful? And some of you have touched on that a little bit in, um, in your comments, but I'd be curious to hear if there's anything you'd like to add. I think I'm already <clears throat> off mute, so I'm happy to start with that. Okay. I think one of the things that gives me strengths during this time, uh, and you know, I think for a lot of Indigenous people, had a very um, uh, poignant histories with pandemics. Both my great grandparents perished from the Spanish flu up in the Canadian North uh, when settlers came. Um, and it um, created a cascade of events through my family because my grandmother was then placed in an orphanage in a re residential school. And then following my mother was in a residential school. So the root of pandemic is sort of the root of the um, uh, dying of uh, culture within our family that we've had to fight to be able to get back. And I think about all those elders having to go through um, all of that uh, trauma and um, experiences throughout the last 150 years, at least within the Canadian North, if not longer in some areas. And, you know, the fact that they come out today still so strong and so able to share their knowledge and their language. And I look to them and, and I just say, wow, you know, they've been through so much and they're here and they're still strong and sharing their stories um, because there's that sense of resilience that I think it gives uh, hope to uh, us younger generations uh, in uh, training 
uh, you know, to be in their positions one day. Um, that, you know, we are in a, a cyclical world and there's purpose in, in why things are happening. And by trusting in that process and working towards uh, what we see as a beneficial society, um, you know, following their guidance is uh, something that really gives me uh, hope and motivation. Um, I think I've just uh, remained so hopeful because of the way that our society is just like remarkably reorganized within weeks um, for the collective good. Uh, and there was very little, like I think the, the vast, vast majority of people, both in Canada and the United States, actually agree with all of the public health measures that have been taken for COVID. And I think that just gives me so much hope that we can take the measures that are required for the climate crisis. And then in addition, as we've already spoken about um, with the Just Recovery, there's such an opportunity here to reorganize. I mean, we've seen um, like so, so many uh, important interventions that various levels of government have made uh, in order to prevent uh, like a a crisis with the COVID pandemic or at least mitigate it um, and like a lot of those uh, social programs and social interventions uh, we can we can continue to advocate for them to remain like like the uh, CERB benefit in Canada uh, for example so I think it's actually quite a hopeful time yeah I um, completely agree with that I'm really inspired by um, uh, what both of you have said and uh, especially what's um, what's been uh, happening in response to uh, to the COVID crisis. Um, just reflecting on what you said, Nicole, and um, and a, a great interview I heard with a journalist named Julian Brave Noisecat. Um, I recommend everyone check it out on uh, CBC Unreserved. But he's he's talking about how um, you know because the values um, uh, align so well with the climate action that are needed, it really needs to be Indigenous people who are leading uh, climate actions. Um, and I agree totally with uh, Samantha that uh, having this pandemic is a wake-up call. Um, you know, sometimes when things are going well, it makes us complacent, and we're seeing where all the uh, the, the gaps are in our society, and it's it's making us take stock of what our values are, what's most important to us, and um, and pushing us to make uh, some rapid changes. Thanks, Edward. I was going to say, well, you still had yourself on. Um, so someone had asked about um, solutions to reduce exploitation of temporary foreign workers in agriculture and food processing and whether you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I've been struggling with that one and, and talking to a few people. I'm certainly not the best person to answer that question. I would uh, recommend you reach out to the Canadian Migrant Rights Network um, and also, uh, you know, the, the 15 for Fairness campaign. Um, what I would say is that, the, you know, one of the reasons why we have uh, temporary foreign workers is that people are not being paid a living wage in Canada and they're working under um, conditions that are unsafe. And so, you know, um, um, uh, Bonifacio uh, dying on the weekend was not the, is, is certainly not the first time that a, a foreign worker uh, has died while working in Canada. Um, and it, it really just points to uh, systemic issues of um, uh, undervaluing work that that is truly essential and, and lets the rest of us carry on, um, you know, our lives and uh, and also undervaluing people uh, who are newcomers or immigrants or, um, uh, you know, looking um, to improve their own lives. Thanks. Um... Sorry, uh, I'm looking at um, uh, Dr. Redfords, did you want to answer that? The question uh, that you had answered in the chat only chatted to the panelists. Oh, okay, sorry. Easy My to do, I do it all the time. Efficiencies here. <laughs> Somebody just asked a question about um, indigenous conceptions around reincarnation and it's a misnomer that Eastern um, uh, regions are the only peoples that have uh, uh, reincarnation within our cultures and indigenous people, yes, um, have very clear senses of reincarnation. In fact, it's one of the reasons why, um, well, not one of the reasons why, but just innately why um, there's such a um, 
uh, a support to ensure that our Mother Earth stays healthy because you can imagine if you're coming back again, uh, you want to be able to come back to a healthy world. So um, even just that viewpoint of being able to um, come back to an Earth system and um, keeping it healthy for future generations, uh, should, you know, should you be coming back through um, other entities or on your own, um, that's ingrainedly innately within the societal culture. Thanks. Um, a big question, solid steps we can take to reduce systemic inequity in our society. I would encourage you to, um, again, I can rechat the, um, the, I can resend the links that I had put in the chat. I think that there's some really concrete um, offers in the 350 article um, and also some, um, really clear other thought pieces around um, defending the police, for example, um, and what that would, um, how that might shift the way that societies work. Um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to our panelists as well. I, I can take a crack at it. I mean, that's a huge question. Um, and no I one has it, the full <clears throat> answer. Your best I, I, shot is great. <clears throat> <laughs> I think it, to answer that question, uh, I'm going to actually address something that Margot Park um, had sent to all panelists, and I don't think everyone can read it, but maybe I'll read it out. Um, so the theme of strengths first as compared to deficit emphasis is woven through all the panelists, especially emphasized by Nicole. Thank you. Um, this creates a big and potentially transformative shift. I'd really be interested to hear more about that. Um, so uh, I, what I... What I really like is, is talking about that strengths first approach. So ideas that have been championed by, by people like Amartya Sen, which is a capability approach to, uh, um, to examining values and, and what promotes wellness and what is good in life, um, or uh, people like Martha Nussbaum. Um, and I think, you know, if we're using that type of framework of, of looking at how do we um, build on people's strengths, how do we um, give uh, people back strength that's been taken away from them or um, you know how do we even just meet people's bas basic needs so that they can actually use their capabilities I think it's important for us to um, consider policy approaches that address um, you know just universal basic services things like clean water um, like food security uh, like safe affordable and, and adequate housing um, yeah so that would be that would be my suggestion um, and, and make sure that we're uh, funding those programs and um, imagining them to be, uh, to be broader than they actually are. Well, also involving uh, those people who are most affected in the, the policy creation and policy planning and not just a, a superficial consultation, but actually building these programs together with the people who are affected. Actually, I, can I just give a, an example just that it relates back to Jen, your initial question around what, what has been bringing me hope uh, in the pandemic and, and with the ongoing climate crisis looming. And uh, just another very small example, but just from my own practice, because I think that's how I grounded my talk. Um, it, is um, so, so both Edward and I have actually been working with an organization, Inner City Health Associates in Toronto, um, that's been working with people experiencing homelessness who are affected by COVID, uh, in addition to uh, just in general. And uh, I think that uh, this organization, which has partnered with the City of Toronto and a bunch of community organizations, has really um, shifted just as a result of the pandemic towards a much more dignity-based, client-centered harm reduction approach uh, in the way that we support people. And uh, in the shelters where we're operating for people who are affected by COVID, either COVID positive or close contacts of people who are, have COVID, like this, it's really centered around um, like a, a peer support model, a harm reduction model, where we're providing people with like exactly the supports that they need and they're there aren't the same barriers that we would see in a traditional medical practice. And, and that was really triggered by this crisis. And, and I, I think it just, um, I, I guess it relates to that question about um, like uh, uh, strength first and like dignity first and like ensuring that in all of the solutions that we are coming up with for the climate crisis, that that, that is like 
the philosophy that we take. So, so for example, like we have, uh, I mean, maybe I shouldn't speak to the details, but like, a, <laughs> like um, a, an, a, a program for providing people with the alcohol that they normally would drink, the cannabis that they normally would use. And like, it's not a questions asked. You don't have to meet criteria. There's no check boxes where you have to like be otherwise drinking hand sanitizer. Like it's just what people need and it's meeting people where, where they're at. So anyway. Yeah, I think I was just uh, going to make a comment on uh, Margot's question. Thanks, Margot, um, about the strength-based piece playing a part in work. And uh, I think we forget sometimes that vulnerable populations often have the, the answers that we need. And um, by recognizing them as um, the source of the solutions, it automatically changes the mindset of how we approach these problems instead of trying to solve problems for people and to aid and help. And, and we get into that mode sometimes as helping agencies or organizations where we want to make impact. Um, and even as providers and clinicians, you know, we're used to helping people and, and forgetting sometimes that we're, we're not there to help, we're there to guide um, and we're there to uh, provide support so that people can come to the, their, their health on their own uh, and gather strength within that process of doing so. So in terms of the approach, I really see um, uh, my work in particular taking that example that um, my elders have always taught me through uh, clinical work, but also through the traditional healing that they do, that they are not there. Uh, to provide healing to people. They are there as guides to be able to encourage and support people to find their way um, and bring out the strengths and innate attributes that they have within themselves so that they can be um, productive and um, um, you know, supportive people within their own communities and societies. Uh, so I always try to remember that within the work that uh, we are not trying to solve problems for people. We are trying to support and guide them to finding solutions uh, on their own and uh, being uh, allies in that process of doing so. Um, and by doing that, we automatically bring confidence, self-esteem to the communities that are often or have been subjugated throughout history. Um, uh, and are uh, aiming or allowed to almost go through a healing process within that uh, mechanism of support. So, uh, you know, I really um, uh, push uh, for uh, folks and organizations to remember that solutions are within those communities. It's just a matter of building those trusts and, and working in the right way so that uh, we can all move forward collectively as a society. You have all have really incredible answers. I feel uh, very fortunate to be able to continue to listen to all of your wisdom. There's a really interesting question from Daniel Raza about um, having kitchen table conversations on climate justice, uh, climate change and, and social justice with friends and family who don't see the links. Um, do any of you have um, suggestions on that? Um, one thing that I have found um, occasionally is asking a lot of questions uh, to the family members. So um, uh, even you know when someone's someone's on a um, climate change is a hoax uh, train of thought, sort of framing it as a like. Um, the what you know why do you think that or what what would you know what might need to what do you what what are the things you find challenging about considering that humans might be causing climate change um when someone has said something particularly like racist or problematic if they're a family member both calling them on it and also also asking could like could you explain how, could you explain how you think that? And like really, really both ca calling it out and, and asking questions so that people are having to do their own exploration as, but the, again, I don't have, um, the, I, I don't have solid answers. Others can totally weigh in. And I guess basing it around like nonviolent communication uh, so acknowledging feelings while challenging some of like the ideas that aren't, um, aren't great ideas. Yeah. 
I think one of the uh, things that um, I always uh, think about when it comes to differing um, belief systems or ways of knowing is that um, when you come into a relationship or an interaction uh, with uh, a positive energy in mind um, of support and of listening. And um, uh, one of that, one of those aspects of listening is so powerful that when you have people that are wanting to share, I really try to just listen and listen and listen more to better understand where those perspectives are coming from. Normally there's a root somewhere uh, that drives that behavior of disconnect between the natural world and between the things around. And most often it has nothing to do with uh, climate change or some of the other issues that are there. And determining that root through listening um, and, and you know, give sometimes a better appreciation for the supports that need to be around that person to enable that healthy relationship with nature to come about naturally again. Um, and, you know, not forcing that way. Uh, and I found that method. Um, and again, through support and watching and listening myself to those um, great leaders that I've had around me do amazing things to, to change behaviors, not necessarily by pushing or forcing, but by encouraging and loving and listening and, and trying to identify roots of where uh, thoughts and, and behaviors are actually coming from. Um, that was great. I'm furiously taking notes here. Um, I really like what Nicole said about different ways of knowing and, and also piecing that with what Samantha had said previously about um, meeting people where they are. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, you know, that listening is helpful because um, no matter what the other person's opinion, I'm sure there will be some um, shared uh, needs and shared values. And, um, and I guess it's about uh, finding a way of connecting those and aligning them. So close to wrapping up, um, I just wanted to give you all a chance to make a final, anything final that you wanted to say that didn't come through in the questions. I also just wanted to reiterate something that Dr. Redford said in the chat which is that equity is not political. And I think we do get pushback from the institutions we're in about, um, about you know, taking, taking a stand or making statements being a political thing. And I, I think that that's a really powerful, succinct capture of a, of a really important truth. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to you one more time for any, anything you'd like to leave us with. Thank you, and uh, thanks to you, Jen, again, and the organizers, and also the uh, participants who have joined us for this hour today to listen and um, allow us to share this space with you for the time being. You know, it's such a huge, important discussion. It's been a, a trying uh, weeks for many here. Um, I'm down in the United States and definitely feeling the energy shifting around um, with powerful um, stories and, and experiences from many people. And, uh, you know, ultimately there is a true humanity that exists within all of us. And it's just a matter of reconnecting those pieces that we all have within us. And I think through powers of uh, love and compassion and uh, using those two years that we have, uh, there's a lot of possibilities that we can do collectively as, as a unit, um, not only as people, but also as animals, plants, and all of the other things that exist around us. And I feel we're at a time where people need hope and they need that connection somehow. And, you know, I truly believe that some of our Indigenous knowledge systems and, and elders, um, you know, are, who are not going to be around for much longer are some of our our biggest strengths and roots right now. And I, I really hope that as time goes on, we see the importance of that reflected more in some of our policy institutions and conversations that we have. So thank you, Masi Cho. Thank you, Nicole, for wrapping us up so succinctly. I have nothing else to add. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll just say that uh, I totally agree that equity, um, you know, should not be political in terms of playing partisan politics, um, but politics in terms of public dialogue, in terms of engagement in society, in terms of participation in government uh, is incredibly important along with protests and, and seeing our, the action that we want to see. Thank you. And thank you all again for joining us. Um, this has been a, a very powerful conversation and I feel so honored and grateful that you that you joined us today. So thank you all very much. Um, I um, will send a follow up email um, to everybody who participated um, with further details about the webinar and some of the resources that were shared. Um, and thank you all very much for your time. Have a wonderful rest of your day.